Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 172 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with Christopher Barrett Sheridan, the flower sommelier, about fragrance in the garden. The plant profile is on Lufa, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with a last word on fairy gardens by Christy Page of the Food Gardening Network. This week, we're joined by Christopher Barrett Sheridan. He is the flower sommelier and a garden educator. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Kathy, for having me. Great to have you on. So Christopher and I have known each other for a few years through the Garden Communicators Association GardenCom. And maybe we'll get into a little bit of some of those experiences. And we're going to talk all about fragrance in plants and scent in the garden. But before we get into that, Christopher, we like to ask our guests on the Garden DC podcast, were they born with a green thumb and chlorophyll in their veins? <laughs> and my answer, sadly, is absolutely not. Um, you know, I'm really the first generation in my family to live in like their whole life in a suburban uh, area. Uh, my parents are originally from Center City, Philadelphia, South Philadelphia. Uh, it's a very nice area, but there was really no green uh, for probably the four generations leading up to me. And so when did you discover plants? Well, I, uh, you know, it's a funny story. I was thinking back, uh, back on this and, uh, you know, I kind of, my first experiences in the garden would have been um, at my parents' house when I was two or three and we had actually a rock garden. It was kind of interesting. Uh, You know, I looked up and the house was built in 1925. So, you know, it was a a porch with a a canvas awning. There were uh, two or three large azaleas. I think they were pink and red, if I remember right, a little bit of a lawn and then a rock garden leading down to a box hedge. And uh, the the adjacent neighbors had a rose bush. So I used to uh, menace the rose bush with my Tonka truck. So I was more of a digger than a gardener uh, in my early years. Hmm. And so when you were playing around that rose bush, did you encounter some scent from that? Do you have any childhood scent memories? Uh, well, I think I, I don't remember specifically about the rose. The, the other interesting thing is that I, I have, I've had allergies my whole life when it comes to dogs and cats and pollen and all of that. So, uh, you know, I really wasn't a fan of uh, yard work until Zyrtec was invented. And uh, but but as far as favorable uh, fragrance, uh, you know, Lana Sarah, there was honeysuckle. Um, my mother was the director of the local recreation center, and there was, I guess, honeysuckle that had escaped, you know, uh, near the ball field and in a couple other places. So that's one of my best memories, I guess, of late spring, early summer uh, when it comes to, to flowers and plants would be the honeysuckle at the baseball field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of us have that childhood memory of honeysuckle near a playground or some play space as a child and using that to um, play with or share or, you know, play house or pretend <laughs> that it, it was a meal or something that we're sharing with each other. Um, because, it, you know, although you don't eat the blossoms, you can kind of pretend. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, the best childhood is one spent with plants. Mm-hmm. So what was your career trajectory? What did you uh, graduate from college and go into? Okay. So originally uh, I studied English literature at Villanova, uh, and then I uh, stayed to do a master's degree in international relations and comparative government. And then I went to Tulane to uh, study environmental law. Um, So, you know, so I always cared about the environment. um, And, you know, with with regard to a career, I clerked for a couple judges, uh, trial and appellate. And then I worked for a group called the Committee of 70, which is a government integrity group going back to the progressive era in 1904. In Philadelphia. So I was in-house counsel and I also did a lot of uh, civic education, volunteer management. Um, so it was really, a, you know, kind of an interesting place to be. And it was actually genuinely nonprofit and uh, genuinely nonpartisan, you know, as, as mostly focused on voter protection uh, and also just government integrity at the municipal level. 
Um, and I, and I really love that. And then I developed an autoimmune disease, which is what kind of necessitated the career change. Hmm. And then when you were looking for that career change, what brought plants or gardening into that scope? Well, with, uh, with regard to, like I said, I'd studied environmental law and, and I, I guess I didn't mention the second house I grew up in was right on Fairmount park. And, uh, and that was in the eighties and that was very much, you know, we had a large lawn and, a you know, foundation shrubs, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Japanese maple. Uh, it was really a, a beautiful place. And I'd always gone to, um, you know, went to a private school. It was very green. And also the rec center is where I, so I spent all my time really in greenery as a kid, uh, one way or the other. And the, uh, so when it was time to, you know, kind of chart a new direction in life, I wanted to be outside. I figured that would be healthy. I also wanted something kind of academic and intellectual, but, you know, hands-on as well. And I think with horticulture, you know, it seems like people, you know, gardeners are happy people. And, and also, um, and I, I, you know, I apologize if I'm running on a little bit here, but, you know, Philadelphia, we like to call it America's garden capital. So it really is, um, one of these creative clusters for horticulture, uh, just like, you know, hospitals and universities. So I think, you know, when you're doing a career change, you want to pick something you enjoy, but also where there's a lot of opportunity where you live. Mm -hmm. I can definitely relate to that. So let's talk a little bit about where you're gardening today and what you're growing. And I know you have two addresses. So let's start with the Pennsylvania one. Uh, so Pennsylvania, uh, we do, um, yeah, it's a lot of, I have fruit trees, I have cherries and apples. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, we have daffodils that do well. I mean, our, our real issue is, uh, is the deer. Uh, so that's, I try to plant things. I plant at Nepeta. Uh, we have uh, mint in pots. Uh, and I recently purchased um, some white jello we're going to plant, uh, as well as a, a white uh, lilac. Uh, so, you know, it really, it's still, sadly, mostly because of the deer situation, you know, uh, lawn and foundation shrubs and some specimen trees. Uh, but that's something I'm going to work on changing. Uh, you know, most of, most of my gardening is really at the shore because you don't have the same sort of deer pressures and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's, and it's a smaller area to maintain, which is helpful. Hmm. And so the shore one, that's New Jersey Townsend's Inlet. Can you describe that growing area? Yeah, it's, it's a, um, uh, basically a large, um, a large border and, um, uh, and I kind of go with a, you know, really a cottage garden style is, is what resonates with me. I, I think uh, going back to how I got into horticulture, originally, you know, Pete Udolph and Meadows, that was kind of one of the first things I really drew me to it. And then, um, and then I just, as I learned more and more, I just really liked the idea of cottage plantings and so forth. Like, um, you know, I've, I've always been a fan of, uh, of impressionism when it comes to painting and art. So I think that's really where the inspiration comes from. But yeah, the plants at the shore, uh, you grow at, you know, Canna and Dahlia, so a little bit of tropical, you know, carnation, dusty miller, uh, some sage, uh, begonias, uh, alliums, uh, minarda, um, and then, uh, you know, some glad gladiolus, lavender, vinca. So a lot of it's what's in season, uh, you know, kind of what's what's commonly used there. And, uh, and we need tough plants because for the bulk of the season, we do rentals. Like we use the house uh, some of the year, but, you know, it's, there's an eight week period where I might be there one day a week. So I try to pick uh, plants that can, can take that situation. Mm -hmm. And being on the coastal plain, so to speak, I imagine it's sandy soils. Yeah, really remarkably sandy. But the, but the upside of that is I have echinacea that's five or six years old because it doesn't have that winter rot, you know, so it, it, it's, you know, it can be very helpful in a lot of ways, the sandy soil, you know, as long as you have the ability to, you know, keep it, keep it watered in, in the heat of the summer. Uh, I think it's actually in some ways, uh, you know, some plants actually really thrive in that situation. And no deer, I take it. No deer. One rabbit who only eats the echinacea. So I guess I guess the bunny knows that echinacea's hunt is uh, healthy. Uh, but <laughs> you know, it's a smart bunny. But yeah, the, the the rabbit doesn't bother anything else we have there. Hmm. And I imagine that's both zone six or seven at both gardens. I think it's seven A and seven B. So the you know the shore would be slightly warmer. Uh, it hasn't quite gotten to frost there yet. Uh, Pennsylvania, we're expecting a uh, frost tonight. But the uh, New Jersey, we might have another week or two. I'm, I'm thinking it might get down to 34, 35 tonight and then bounce back. Hmm. So you do get a longer, you know, it could be a two or three week longer season if you get lucky. Hmm. And are you growing edibles aside from the fruit trees at the Pennsylvania one? Do you to tomatoes or summer edibles or anything like that? Uh, 
Mostly, uh, mostly just mint on the deck. My father's been growing tomatoes uh, for most of my life, uh, my adult life, uh, when they moved to a, a new house in the 80s. And so, uh, yeah, so he's known for tomatoes and cucumbers. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's a lot of what we do. Uh, that's something I really want to do more of, uh, especially now that I'm you know, specializing in fragrant plants. I really want to grow all of the herbs and, and a lot of the uh, fruits and vegetables. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, putting a new garden in. And I think, you know, the other challenge is when you have a, a health condition. I had one year where I had a community garden plot at Morris and my health would go every two or three weeks and I get overrun with thistles. So, you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, when you have one of these conditions, it's it's hard to have the continuity of, of being a gardener. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, you know, so that's why I'm a little bit more on the academic side, even though I absolutely respect everybody that, that you know, does the full-time gardening and the full-time uh, hands-on work. You know, I, I absolutely believe in it, but sometimes it can be hard to keep up with. Mm -hmm. So uh, you call yourself the flower sommelier. Um, and were you a wine sommelier at one point? Uh, sort of. This is uh, after after my health condition developed. I worked. Uh, a friend of mine owned a wine boutique in Delaware, uh, a very nice place. It's no longer there. And uh, so yes, yeah, so I started helping out, and then eventually I was uh, basically the weekend manager. So I would write the tasting notes. Uh, so I've probably written four or five hundred wine notes. I've probably tasted eight or nine hundred wines. And, uh, and that's kind of having a literary background and then just an appreciation for wine. And that's what kind of, you know, gave me the inspiration for the brand because it's in a way it's, it's serious, but it's also kind of mocking myself. You know, it's meant to be funny. You know, it's meant to give people a smile. Uh, that's kind of how I intend it. And, and in the same sense, I think we should bring the same sense of enjoyment and adventure we have with wine or beer or whiskey, depending on what you enjoy, you know, to flowers. So I think we should, like I said, bring the same enthusiasm. And that's what I'm hoping to promote. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I always wonder with those some of those wine descriptions, they can get a little like in the weeds, so to speak, <laughs> where you're talking about some of the adjectives and descriptions that they do um, get a little, I would say, floriferous. Yes, bacon and burnt rubber. And yeah, the wine wheel is pretty wild. I mean, we'll probably talk some about, you know, for fragrance classifications today. But, uh, but yeah, I think with the you know, the wine wheel really does get a little bit nutty at times. Um, yeah, I mean, basically you get grapes and sometimes peppery and fruity. I mean, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, so, you know, hopefully one of the things I'd like to see us develop as, as uh, garden writers and horticulturists is uh, basically a fragrance wheel that's comparable to the uh, color wheel. And it might not be a wheel. It might be a pentagon. It might be a square. It might be a, a triangle among the, um, you know, among the fragrances and scents that we consider desirable, you know, how they relate to each other. And I think there's been some great work done with perfume, but the, the, the situation there is you're dealing with, uh, you know, it's, it's an oil that's a product. It's a, you know, um, a, a, I'm thinking diffusion, but, you know, distilled, you know, you're looking dealing with distilled products, which, you know, certainly have validity, but that's not the same as the complexity of a leaf or flower growing in the ground. Um, the same way our vitamins aren't the same as the food we eat. So I think that's a helpful start for us, uh, the work that the perfumers have done on this. But I do think people, you know, like I said, in the plant world, it's, it's something that uh, I think we could be working on. Um, you know, so, so I think that's part of where I take the inspiration for that is, is from wine. And just, uh, you know, one of the things when I did the presentation at GardenCom this summer is I just I really like to kind of have us all speaking the same language and speaking more of it when it comes to plants. Hmm. Yeah, so Christopher is referring to the annual meeting we had in Minneapolis for the Garden Communicators and a virtual conference we also have where his talk on um, flower scents is available. And so diving into that, um, talking about a color wheel and shared, you know, sense of what we're both looking at or we're both smelling, um, do we all have the same sense of scent? You know, that's one of the things that we always ask ourselves is, am I seeing the same blue that you're seeing or am I smelling the same thing that you're smelling? And I think the, the quick answer to that is no. Uh, I did a little bit of research and, you know, the National Institutes of Health, uh, they talk about uh, there's odor detecting cells that we all have and, and we have many, many of them. Um, but we don't all have the same mix of cells. So I think that's why some people... Um, have a more, more acute scent, like something that's really pungent, we probably all get, you know, depending on the intensity of the fragrance, 
you know, sometimes we're all going to get the same thing, but as things as, as sense are more subtle, we get a different perspective on it. And, and I also think that, um, you know, and this is partially my philosophy and partially what I've seen in the literature, you know, scent is so closely tied to memory. We have positive, we have negative memories, and that could, you know, definitely uh, impact our perception. You know, the plants from your grandmother's garden or your, your mother or father's garden, you know, that that's going to be a positive uh, item for most people. Uh, the native plants from what part of the country you're from probably have special meaning to you from your childhood. Um you know, uh, more, whether we're part of a faith group or nationality, that you know, the flowers that are used in the celebrations of that group probably have significance for those people. And then I, I do think the people who, um, you know, cook you know, herbs, spices, fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, I think the, the more different cuisines you have, you enjoy and the more ingredients, you know, uh, plant ingredients you used to cook with probably the better your scent palette is as far as being able to talk about things. So I think it's good for all of us to try a lot of new things. Um, and, you know, one, one thought that came to me today is that, you know, our perceptions, we might even be introduced by flower color. You know, th there are hot colors, there are cool colors, uh, you know, whether a flower is something that is common or whether it's from the Orient or whether it's from the Middle East or South America, you know, things that are exotic to you, you might perceive a more exotic scent than the plants that you grew up with, regardless of the merits of each. So I think that's another kind of, uh, whether it's folklore or anthropological consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree with you that a lot of it is cultural too, because, you know, you may love the scent of marigold. I may hate the scent of marigold. Um, but that might have been a childhood memory or it just might be the pungency to my nose versus your nose. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's also, um, if you think about, um, you know, those of us who were around in the 70s and 80s, remember when there were like one or two tomatoes at the supermarket? Uh, you know, there might have been one carnation you didn't like as a child, but now there are a hundred, you know, thanks to slow flowers and people like that. So that's another thing to kind of consider that some of the plants, if we don't love the ones we grew up with, that might not be the best example of the genus or species or, uh, you know, any of the, any of the subcategories. So that's something to kind of keep in mind too, just the abundance of choices we have now, you know, I wouldn't assume just like, you know, there, you might not like one IPA, but you might love a different IPA if you're a beer drinker. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's very true, especially of roses. Cause um, in the Rose Society, we talk about, of course, whether a rose is scented at all, but then you have the classic rose fragrant, that rose essential oil. But there are many roses that have a spicy scent or a lemon scent. Um, and if you were to smell them with a blindfold, you would never say that that's a rose scent. No, ab absolutely. And I think roses, there's just so much variability because they come from so many parts of the world. I mean, the breeding material. Uh, so, yeah, so I think, you know, and that's that's a whole category in and of itself. And I think roses are probably the greatest challenge in um, studying fragrance uh, among flowers. It really is a complex category. Hmm. So let's dial it back and talk about why do plants have scent in any case? Like why, what is the purpose of a flower or a plant part having any scent to it? Well, I think that um, for the most part, it's about, you know, attracting pollinators. Uh, and, you know, and, and when we think of it, most of the scents are pleasing to us are also uh, pleasing, uh, you know, to, to the bees and the butterflies and so on. Uh, and then you know, a lot of the rich scents, a lot of the, the evening plants have a, like a richer fragrance because it has to carry further to reach, you know, um, moths and, uh, and bats or a lot of our evening pollinators. And then we have the situation where, you know, the stinky fragrances are pretty much there for um, for flies as well as for uh, beetles. So if you think about the, um, you know, the Titan Arum and, uh, you know, there's, uh, I think we might get to this a little later, but, you know, the Stipalia gigantea is called the carrion flower. Uh, so there's, you know, something that, so there's all the different um, fragrances that it depends on the pollinator relationship. And some of the early classification systems, it was the essential oil and the pollinator relationships was how they uh, how they tried to categorize everything. So that's something that they looked at. Um, but when we look at the other parts of uh, so so that's with the flowers, it's almost always about pollinators, pollinator relationships. Uh, when we look at um, bark, it's generally uh, going to be about deterring uh, pest, whatever pest. Like you know, cinnamon is a bark. You know, there's certainly a lot of a lot of examples. So, um, 
And when you look at roots, we have ginger, uh, turmeric, fennel. Fennel, actually, the fragrance runs, of course, through the whole plant, uh, as well as probably the others have so, some measure of fragrance. But the roots, so that's largely probably a deterrent for whatever underground pest uh, you know, might be involved there. Uh, so, so that's another case of, of deterrence. Uh, when you look at foliage, it's also for herbivores. They want to, you know, there's a lot of things we enjoy that the deer and rabbits leave alone. So it's, that's another, another aspect of it. I think one thing we don't really talk about enough is, you know, when we think about oranges and lemons and even apples and, you know, tomatoes, but the foliage and the tomato have a fragrance uh, that's kind of very much tomato. And so a lot of it is to spread their seeds. Like we know it's okay. We want to, we want to draw on our pollinators. We want to defend ourselves from pests, but you know, it's not just the colors of the fruits. Uh, it's also, um, it's also the fragrance that I think draws, uh, you know, seed spreaders as including humans uh, mm -hmm. to help them do their work. Yeah. I think it's uh, Michael Pollan's book where he talks about the relationship of plants and humans and that the some of the plants have tricked humans into using them as um, pollen or seed spreaders oh yeah absolutely yeah we're, we're working for them um and you know another interesting one is like sweetbriar foliage it's not the rose of the sweet i think it's eglantine uh, the sweetbriar that's fragrant it's it's the foliage and i think it usually needs like morning dew or some moisture to really perform uh, another fun one is that uh Cercidophyllum japonicum, so katsura, uh, in the fall, the leaves smell like burnt sugar, toffee, or cotton candy are some of the representations. Uh, I think walnuts also have a pretty distinctive uh, fragrance in fall, fall in, you know, the walnut itself. Uh, and then Francis Bacon in 1625 uh, mentioned uh, dying strawberry leaves are supposed to be very sweet. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, that's another one, bacon in, on gardens kind of set forth uh, a whole lot of plants that we would recognize now. Uh, in, in his essay that's literally 400 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, uh, you know, the, some things change, but the, but we, we tend to, we love the classic centuries or millennia later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that Katsura leaf scent, you know, stepping on those leaves and you release that sugary scent. And that definitely makes you want to plant one in your yard and propagate it and share it. Yeah, absolutely. And also the thyme and the cam chamomile are great path plants as well. And, and some of the mints for, uh, you know, as far as things that you can lightly walk on uh, and generate some fragrance. Mm -hmm. And repel some of those pests. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about um, fragrance categorization. So we're trying to, you know, make it scientific that what I am detecting from a flower is the same thing that you're detecting from a flower and use some of those same descriptive terms. So can you talk about some of those categorizations that already exist? Sure. Well, I think I can just, we're going to talk about one of them, but just to kind of give a little bit of the history, uh, Frank Anthony Hampton wrote the center of the, the center flowers in 1925. And that was the first real modern classification system. And he had separate categories for um, flowers and foliage. Uh, and then in the late 1960s, Wilson and Bell, uh, who uh, were, uh, you know, a serious amateur garden gardeners, one was a writer, one was an illustrator, they developed their own system. Uh, and it's the modern classifications of fragrance as part of a book called The Fragrant Year, a real beautiful book. That's something everyone should have from 1967. Um, and so... British American, and then we get back to Stephen Lacey in the 80s and 90s came up with a, a set of classifications that you can find in the RHS Companion, which came out in 2014, the updated version. And so um, Lacey follows Hampton in keeping uh, separate categories for uh, foliage and, and flowers. And most recently, Ken Drews uh, in the Sensual Garden, uh, yeah, he has his own system. It's 12 categories. And what I really like about Ken's system is that he um, he has primary and secondary scents. Uh, and I think it was Ellen Hovicamp was his um, a photographer and also his collaborator. And they went through and really set us up with, they formalized the idea that, you know, what are you, you know, Kathy, you and I might get something different from a flower. Well, Kathy might be getting the primary scent and I might be getting one of the secondary scents Um just based on our perception and, and so forth. So I think that's, you know, kind of a very interesting advance from my point of view that, you know, we can talk in terms of, well, what's the primary? And then there might be one, two, three, four secondaries, depending on whether 
the flower is emerging or at its prime or senescing. And same thing with foliage is that everything goes through a life cycle. So that really, so secondary qualities or secondary scents really uh, are valuable to our discussion. So that's kind of the, the big picture um, of, of kind of how we got here. Uh, and, and so far there hasn't really been um, one unified system. I mean, they all have a lot of merit, uh, but it, you know, that's one of those things I think it would be great that if we could get towards a color wheel, uh, you know, something that's, you know, widely accepted and widely used would be great. Uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't mean to, to digress too much there. But so just as an example, uh, you know, for uh, I'll use Lacey for this one. Uh, Lacey has uh, under exotic, uh, he has jasmine officinale, tobacco flowers and clerodendron tychotromum. Um you know, for vanilla and almond, he has Clematis armandii in Montana, and then a Bilophyllum and Umlaria. And, and I do apologize for my, uh, my botanical Latin is not the best. <laughs> I'm good at spelling it. I'm not necessarily good at speaking it. <laughs> I think all of us are, have stumbled over some of that botanical Latin, but, you know, I've been told that any pronunciation is correct. Yeah. And I think one I like here with Lacey, just, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cause there are no Romans here to correct us. Uh, but the, uh, but the, like French perfumes, I think that's a great way of d- d- describing a category. So that's Lily of the Valley, uh, Mahonia japonica, which I think is winter blooming and then skimmia. So like Lily of the Valley, people will say, what's the fragrance Lily of the Valley. And there's nothing wrong with saying lavender smells like lavender. You know, some things just are so distinctive. Uh, violet smells like violet. Uh, although there are other flowers that smell like violet, just like there are some of the geraniums smell like roses. So, so th- this is basically how the systems are organized. And, you know, for Lacey does um, the flower scents, just to run through the, uh, just the overview of the categories. Uh, so it's exotic, spicy is the second one, vanilla and almond, uh, pea scent, P-E-A, uh, French perfumes. And then he has rose, fruit, honey, rogue scents, and then less pleasant scents, which he's being polite about. And uh, so, and, and generally speaking, going back to Hampton, roses are always their own category. Um, you know, each of the people who've done this takes a slightly different approach on what belongs in heavy, what belongs, you know, in, in honeyed and so forth. Hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times we just use simplistic terms like sweet or um, pungent. Um And I would think, you know, just trying to classify it as almost an edible type of term. So lemony or spicy or fruity, we're talking more about our taste, actually, than the scent or fragrance. Yeah, I I think absolutely. And that's one of the strengths. Uh, There's a lot of great things about Ken Drews's book. But one of them is that he has a a pretty good set of uh, adjectives when it comes to describing each of his categories, pretty comprehensive and closer to like the wine wheel example we were talking about earlier, where uh, some of it's creative, some of it might be a little bit far out, but it gets us beyond floral and sweet and so forth. And then with Lacey, um, again, so he has he follows Hampton has uh, foliage categories. So, um, you know, so just the categories are spice, aniseed, uh, rose uh, for foliage as well as flower, fruit, camphorous and pungent, resinous, uh, mint and eucalyptus, fresh and green, and then less pleasant, again, putting it politely. So uh, this might be one of those, you know, how, Kathy, you do your uh, your different uh, events, uh, your horticultural events. This could be an interesting quiz uh, opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's talk a little bit of an aside about some of those not so pleasant scents and how people experience them. So you mentioned earlier the Titan Arum. Um, so that yeah, I mean, if, uh, yeah, was it a Morphophallus t- yes. Titanium? <laughs> so and uh, that one actually, people want to experience the horrific scent of that and be in that room. Why would humans want to do that? I think. It's just people, it's, I guess it's like extreme sports. It's extreme flowers, right? <laughs> Some people are really drawn to that. And, uh, and yeah, and it is, it's interesting because usually it's like a reddish brown, uh, the flower. And I think that's the inside of the spathe when it comes to the Titan Arum is, is like a blood red. It really, uh, in addition to the smell and, uh, so that's certainly the most, most famous of the stinky plants. Another one, uh, and I think we, we all love the structure of it, uh, like the architecture, uh, the Fritillaria imperialis, uh, Fritillaria, 
to the crown imperial. I mean, it's usually, you have those pendant flowers. They're usually what a, a solid orange or gold with like a little ruffle of a, it almost looks like a leaf ruffle around them. It's a, it's a beautiful plant, but you want to put that at the back of the border, but it's described as a, you know, foxy and sweaty. Uh, so those are things we do not want in the front of the border or under our window. Uh, so, um, I mean, another example, and this is interesting because it's the, uh, the pawpaw, Asamina triloba. Uh, the flowers are reddish brown. They're actually kind of pretty. It's a, it's, it's a nice little shape. Um, and I guess in some ways it's almost like a little, uh, trillium, you know, because of the whole, but they said it's, it's, it's in, and I've, I've actually smelled this one. It's like, it does smell like carrion and, and the, um, it's flies that, uh, do the pollination, but then the fruit is supposed to be one of the greatest delicacies, delicacies anywhere. And it's hard to find because it's, uh, I read a great book years ago called Paw Paw. Uh, but, you know, you have to be in that region of like Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, I guess parts of Maryland and Virginia might have pawpaws. Um, and you can certainly plant them. I guess you need two of them in order to set fruit. But uh, but because it's so perishable, you can't even necessarily find it at the farmer's market unless it's abundant in that area. So, but, you know, so you have this awful flower and then you have this wonderful fruit that comes from it. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um you know, another famous one would be the uh, ginkgo, the fruit, right, is uh, yes. is something that it can be. And they actually had these at my grade school, and I remember walking on them. It was awful, uh, you know, the ginkgo fruit, in the, I guess, in the fall. Uh, but I know some cultures, the, the seeds, people roast the seeds, and, uh, and there's warnings to eat them in small quantities, but the seeds are a delicacy. I think especially among Asian cultures. So, uh, so that's another one that, you know, you would think if you looked at it, you would never know that there was something really special inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think many of us in, especially in Washington, DC have had that experience of coming around a corner of a block and smelling something, you know, akin to dog vomit, let's just call it that and not knowing where it came from and then realize you're stepping in it. Um, and that's the fallen ginkgo fruit on the ground. But yeah. yeah. And, yeah and you have the ones, yeah, people can be a little ambiguous too. And like the uh, Bradford pear, you know, fishy or cat urine, uh, the descriptions, mm -hmm. uh, boxwood, cat urine, again, uh, Crataegus, you know, hearth hawthorn, fishy or an ammonia scent. So there, so some things it's interesting, some repel us all. But I think this goes back that if you grew up in England where you have uh, you know, hawthorn hedges, then maybe that's it reminds you of home. So it's, it's not a bad thing. So, it, it, so that's another one is, you know, we have our friends uh, all over the world could have very different perspectives on the same plant based on, on their uh, life experience. Mm -hmm. Or cultural uh, connotations to them. But I would say that very much so with some of the boxwood that does have that, you know, I'll just call it sour scent to it. and. Um, Hutonia is another one that comes to mind, chameleon plant, because I know people when they're trying to dig it up out of the ground, it has just like a horrible gasoline type scent. Um, some people describe it as very skunk like, which is, again, not another pleasant scent. Yeah, there's the, the yeah the skunk cabbage is another one with the reddish brown and green uh, the spathe you know, rotten rotten flesh and then the the when you look at the terminology when we did the presentation this summer it was at all the uh, botanical Latin that refers to um, what's it call it to fragrance and one of my favorite yeah you know, here scene if I'm pronouncing it right and you know it's goat like you know I don't know. <laughs> you know, you want anything goat, certainly not among your house plants. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. at the back of the border, but that's it. But it's funny, some of the terms that, that come up to describe these plants. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in particular of, of plants that have it in their common name too, like stinking hellebore, um, mm -hmm. hellebore's fetidus, so fetid. Yeah. And it really doesn't smell that bad. That, that makes it sound like something you would never want in your garden. I know, it's something you send to your worst enemy if you could. But yeah. yeah, the ones when it has something like corpse flower as a name, um, I think you can pretty much bet that you're not going to enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing I talked about in the summers, you know, the common names can be, you know, sweet grass and you, you, you can think of all the different, um, all the different common names for these, uh, for these plants that really also help us understand that it's a fragrant plant. Some are negative, some are positive, um, but it's you know, it's interesting the tie between the fragrant plants and the folklore, as well as the language of flowers, is very strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking back to a lot of poetry, especially you know from Shakespeare on, um, using some of those and some of those uh, that some poets refer to. We don't get much of a scent anymore, so the poet might talk about um, primroses 
And unless I'm getting down all the way, you know, down to the ground, I'm not really smelling a primrose that much. No, I think it's, yeah, a lot of it is, uh, you know, the history of breeding. I mean, generally if larger flowers or longer bloom period. I think with genetics, you, when you, what, whatever you get, you're generally giving something up is kind of the common wisdom on that. So, uh, so, you know, hopefully we'll see. Um, and I think I've already begun to notice it in the last year or two, people are, you know, talking more about fragrant plants. Uh, I've seen more advertising. Hopefully we get back to breeding plants for their fragrance uh, and not just their, their color and, and longevity and durability. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. A lot of the landscape roses, the the fragrances bred out, not on purpose, and but you know just because other traits were selected for, and that can certainly be bred back in just by introducing a more fragrant cross with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's uh, yeah. I think that's the future. You know, we'll we'll see that. Um... So how about some fragrant houseplants? Um, so having them inside, I think in particular when I say houseplants about paper whites and forcing them for the holiday season. And I'm not a huge fan of that kind of astringent smell, that strong smell or, or forcing the Dutch hyacinths can be a little bit too fragrant, even though it's a pleasant fragrance, it's just a little too much in a confined space. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think that's true. Like the, the um, intensity of hyacinths, I'm not really a fan of paper whites. That's, that's one that, you know, I kind of always felt was, was a little bit strong. Uh, I, I haven't smelled it myself, but I, you know, you have Hoya and then really the, there's so many different orchids. Uh, you know, if you're looking for a fragrant house plant, I think there's probably literally hundreds, if not thousands of orchids that offer that. Uh, and that's a category I haven't had a chance to get deep into just because it's so massive. Um, but I know, um, but there's actually a book by Stephen Frowein on fragrant orchids. that's very good. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think, and, you know, I actually like in the house, uh, we'd want to, um, there was a pot of, uh, of dianthus uh, brought into the house that was going to be planted, but I just sat it on the uh, dining room table uh, at the beginning of the summer at the beach. And it really, it perfumed the whole house in a pleasant way with the spiciness and all of that. And I don't remember the, the cultivar, uh, but but that's something that, you know, and, and in some ways it's interesting too, that, that would probably be thought of as a more masculine scent. In some sense are probably considered more feminine. Um, but I think they're all special. It's kind of like there, there's a season for everything. Um, okay. So, you know, there's the things you truly love, but I think it's good to make room for things that are, that are interesting as well. Uh, and maybe you grow to love them. Yeah, and I like your example of the dianthus because, again, the florist carnations that have been bred uh, for decades now are pretty much scent-free, um, and I would say generic. Uh, but when you're getting those garden-grown carnations, the dianthus, you, you have that beautiful spiciness to them. And that does bring in scent when you bring cup flowers inside to enjoy. So I'm thinking like an armful of lilacs brought in or mock orange. What are what are some of your favorite cup flowers to experience? Uh, yeah, I like uh, like lilac. Uh, I mean, mock orange. I definitely like any, anything citrusy. Uh, you know, is it magnolia, magnolia grandiflora. So I think the, the citrusy magnolias, uh, you know, cherry blossoms, wonderful. Uh, apple blossom, too. Uh, and that's something that you can do. Uh, you know, if you have a tree, you can do bring some cuttings in. Um, winter sweet is one of my favorite. I guess it's Chimenanthus praecox. Uh, they have one at uh, Morris Arboretum by the um, Welcome Center. That's just really wonderful because in February, that's that's really what's what's popping. Um, and it's it's more subtle. All the witch hazels, I think, are, are, are a good category that can also be you know used as cuttings as well. Um, you know, just uh, and you know, it's it just there's there's so many to choose from. Sometimes I get a little bit overwhelmed thinking through the list. Um, you know, daffodils, you know, uh, what's it? Yeah, it's a narcissus. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, was it the triand? Usually the smaller and the uh, species daffodils, I think, tend to have the most fragrance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, species tulips. And that's something I haven't had a chance to research personally, but I know from the books that there's a, you know, can have a fair amount of fragrance. The, uh, the, the original tulips, the natives. Yeah, I think they were very, I've forced them indoors and they just have a very light fragrance, not as much compared to, say, a daffodil or a hyacinth. But still good. And I was going to say for the um, witch hazel, I don't know anybody who doesn't love the scent of witch hazel flowers. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's really. uh, And I think it's a lot like the snowdrops and the um, the Aranthus hymalis um, winter aconite. You know, it's like with the, the way we love the small bulbs in the winter. 
you know, it's because they're, that's what we've got. You know, it's like some of the winter bulbs aren't impressive compared to the spring and, and later bulbs. But I think the uh, the winter fragrant shrubs, it's, you know, it, and the air is clean and crisp. And I think that's a lot of what we uh, yeah, embrace about those plants is that it's, uh, you know, kind of like a, a ray of sunshine when, when there's not a lot of alternatives. Mm-hmm. And I'm also thinking of like the depths of summer when it's hot and humid out and the lilies, anything in the lily family, it just, you know, kind of just hangs in the air really thickly. I, I love that scent. Yeah. And it's a dramatic flower. I mean, the, 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 the shape is, you know, kind of adds to the, you know, the fragrance fits the flower, you know, and it's funny. Sometimes it's almost like, you know, people and their dogs matching or something, you know, how people <laughs> we sometimes say that, you know, it's like, uh, you can match the person with the dog, but you can also, I think often match the fragrance with the, uh, with the actual inflorescence it's coming from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes you're standing in the middle of the garden and you don't know where that scent is coming from. And I find that I think Osmanthus is one of those that I would call sneakily scented. Yeah. And it's, and I think that's the other thing is, you know, the, the, something can, uh, and, and in the literature, something may not smell wonderful if you put your nose in the flower, uh, but if you're further away, it's really enjoyable. And it might be that the heavy molecules that don't travel far are unpleasant and the lighter molecules of fragrance that might go five, 10, 15 feet are quite pleasant. So that's, that's another interesting dynamic uh, that, that some of the flowers have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard that some research that the close-up scent of some flowers aren't supposed to be experienced um, because they're trying to repel you at that, but then they're trying to attract the pollinator um, from the air to come visit it. Right. Yeah. So they might want the pollinator, but they don't want the deer taking a bite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's exactly. probably. Yeah, and I hadn't <laughs> thought of that before, but that's that's probably a very good strategy. Yeah. So that uh, that always makes me think of like a, a toddler or a kindergartner having a totally different experience of your garden than you are. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't know. We, I don't think we've gotten to the evening scents yet. Do you want to touch on that? Sure. Let's talk on those. Okay. Well, Nicotian is one of my favorites. Um, and I just pulled a few from, from a list I have. I think everyone will know, um, you know, evening primrose is beautiful and, and the primrose it, you know, you also get that moon garden garden effect from the flower. Uh, so that's a cool one. Uh, you know, Detour, the thorn apple is, uh, it's kind of like a baby Brugmansia, I guess is, is kind of the way of looking at it. And then the Mirabilis uh, jalapa, uh, four o'clock's open in the evening. Um, and day lilies, uh, you know, I've read are more fragrant at night than during the day, which is, uh, kind of an interesting, the, the flower lasts the day, but it performs at night. And then there's Sestrum and Jasmine, uh, Matthiola, also known as evening stocks. And that's another one where, um, you know, the, the common name gives you a, gives you, well, actually it doesn't give you a hint. I'm thinking evening scent. Um, but yeah, so, so I think there's, and there's maybe 40 or 50, um, you know, evening plants that are fragrant, uh, which, uh, you know, I mean, most of us have more time in our garden at night to enjoy it. So it's really makes sense to look those up and and plant them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a recent episode about moon gardening and of course the scent of the garden and some of those evening flowering, uh, plants are essential to the moon garden experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I've already read that. I actually, I was asked to review that, uh, moon garden for a magazine. So I've, I've read it and I, yeah, I thought your interview was wonderful and the book is, is wonderful as well. Hmm. Well, thank you. And I'm sure the author thanks you as well. So, um, wrapping up about sense in the garden, uh, what can we say to those people who don't have much of a sense of smell? Um, what are some really strong, strong plants that they might still be able to experience or detect? Uh, well, I think I'm just pulling up the, uh, we have the, like I said, Wilson and Bell under the heavy category. We have the Lilium erratum. We have Jasmine. We have a uh, orange blossom. Uh, we have gardenias, uh, jonquils, the jonquil, the narcissus, uh, cestrum. Uh, I think honeyed would be another good category if you think about. Um, so, well, hawthorn, if arbutus, um, mahonia uh, is, is in the heavy category. Uh, so, yeah, and I think the, uh, I'm just uh, kind of thinking about it, but I, th- I think things that are, that are more pungent. And, uh, and the other one is, I, you know, people can, I actually recently ordered one of those aromatherapy uh, kits uh, and, 
it has maybe 70 different flower essences. So I'm going to try and teach myself uh, with, with the aromatherapy uh, items, just to, you know, things that we just don't encounter. We know the names of, but you rarely see them in a, in a, in a public garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that that's, you know, whether it's people, uh, you know, arranging flowers or, uh, you know, uh, growing them in their garden or just visiting public gardens. Uh, and, 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 and the least the literature does say that we lose our, our sense of smell does decline for many of us as we get older. So I think just like your brain, just like your muscles, the best way to keep it is probably to actively use it. So, um, so I think that's for people that have a, a lesser uh, sense of smell, maybe to try and train it to the extent they can. Um, and then just really go with, uh, you know, focus on, on things that are, you know, like I said, more pungent, more strong, or, I mean, hyacinth, I mean, you think about that, that that's very powerful and it's mm-hmm. pleasant. It's just a lot. Um, and, you know, one of my favorites, I don't know that we talked much about, it might be one of your favorites as well, violets. I just, you know, I love the the happy faces and, and the fragrance is just like spring. That's kind of how I think of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do adore violets. And another scent I was thinking of that doesn't come from the flower necessarily or is balsam or pine and just having that essential oil available or having a candle that is infused with that essential oil is a great thing to have around the holidays to evoke those childhood memories. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's another one for people who may be a little bit, uh, their uh, sense of smell would be a little bit compromised. You know, I mean, rubbing uh, mint, rubbing rosemary, and then having the essence on your fingers might be a way you know, of experiencing it more so than just dipping your nose into a bloom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I'm a big fan of essential oils just because of those reasons you stated in that you can have those year round, not just when the blossom is in bloom in your garden or that you have access to it at a public garden, but also you can share it and you can experience it whenever you want to. Yeah, absolutely. So how can our listeners contact you, Christopher? Okay, well, my website is www.flowersomalier.com. Uh, dot com with just one S in the middle. And uh, my Instagram is flower.somalier.com. But if you go to my website, there's a contact link uh, where you can email me directly. And that literally in a minute is in my email. And uh, and also my other links to social media, uh, as, as well as LinkedIn for anyone in the horticulture world. If you would like to connect on LinkedIn, obviously, it's, it's great to hear from folks. Uh, so yeah, so so the website's really a good way of connecting with me on, on any of the social media that you might uh, use and enjoy. Great. And I know that you have some upcoming talks and classes scheduled. Do you want to share a little bit about those? Uh, sure. I'm going to be teaching three classes at Longwood next year. And uh, the first one we're going to do on April 16th is going to be a Tussie Mussy workshop. Uh, so we're going to do a tour of spring fragrant flowers, and then we're going to do two arrangements uh, in the atrium of the gift shop because uh, Longwood is still undergoing massive renovations. So uh, we, I don't know that we'll have an education building for about a year. So uh, so we go where, where there's room. Uh, but yeah, but I'm really looking forward to that. And we're going to do a fragrant Ikebana class in the summer, and we're going to do a bulb lasagna in the fall. And I have a lot of other things in the works, but but not quite final yet. Excellent. And for those listeners outside the Mid-Atlantic U.S. A region, Longwood that he's referring to, of course, is Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. All right, Christopher, thank you so much for sharing the theories and some interesting facts all about scents in the garden. Um, do you want to share maybe one final scent for our listeners to enjoy? Uh, I think uh, Philadelphia's uh, mock orange is one that I really like. I think that's generally in June. They're, they're, uh, I think it's just really pleasant. That's one that just kind of says summer to me. And, and, and again, going back to childhood, the, uh, the honeysuckle, I think we all have really positive memories of that. Um, so that's, that's another one I would mention. Excellent. Thank you, Christopher. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Lufa plant profile. Lufa, Lufa species, is a gourd that is dried and used to make a sponge. It is an annual vine that is part of the cucumber and squash family. It is hardy from USDA zones 7 to 13. There are two main kinds of Lufa, the Lufa egyptica, 
also known as the angled loofah, ridged loofah, Chinese okra, or vegetable gourd, and the loofah acutangular, or loofah cylindrica, also known as the smooth loofah, Egyptian loofah, dish rag gourd, or gourd loofah. Plant them from seed in late spring in a full sun location with good draining soil that has been amended with compost or aged manure. The vines can grow up to 30 feet, so a large trellis or fence is required to support them. The bright yellow flowers of the loofah vine are quite attractive. When pollinated, they grow into a long green gourd. Leave them on the vine until they start to turn yellow or brown. Then peel them to reveal the fibrous sponge inside. Shake out the seeds and save a few to plant next year. Then wash off any sticky sap in a bucket of soapy water. Dry them in the sun. The young fruits and flowers of the loofah vine are all edible as well. Loofah vine can be attacked by the cucumber beetle and and can get touched by powdery mildew during hot, humid weather. Otherwise, it's relatively disease and pest free. The vines will die after they are hit with a frost and can then be composted. Loofah, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, Like most of us in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, I got hit by a frost or freeze a couple nights ago, and my garden took somewhat of a hit, but some things are still going pretty well. I think the coleus is the one that got it the worst, but my dahlias are still looking great, as are my impatiens and lantana. Some local gardening events that you might want to attend include the virtual meeting of the Potomac Rose Society on Sunday, November 19th at 2 p.m. It is a spring rose garden tour and that will take you through several rose gardens up and down the East Coast, starting with the Jasper Crane Rose Garden at Brandywine Park in Wilmington, Delaware, and ending with the Reisenhausen Park Rose Garden of the Garden Club at McKee's Arboretum, McKeesport, Pennsylvania. And you can sign up for that for free. It is open to the public. You just have to register to get the Zoom link at potomacrose.org. Another upcoming event that I'd love for you to participate in is the discussion group, Our Garden Book Club. And that is on Thursday, November 30th from 6.30 to 8 p.m., via zoom and you can register through for that through our washingtongardener.blogspot.com website and just look for the garden book club and we are discussing orchid muse a history of obsession in 15 flowers by erica hanical and another event that i know you'll be looking forward to this holiday season is longwood garden celebration of a very retro christmas That starts on November 17th and runs through January 7th, 2024. Longwood Gardens is, of course, located in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and it has um, time tickets, so you'll need to register and purchase those through longwoodgardens.org. Happy gardening! Hey there, garden lovers. This is Ray Eaton, founder of Discover Garden Tours. I'm here to invite you all to join us next April and experience the beauty of Dutch gardening and horticulture on our Discover the Netherlands tour. Please join us and speaker, author, and social media influencer, Kathy Jentz, for this once in a lifetime garden adventure. We'll visit private and public gardens, flower shows and auctions, and much, much more. Highlights include the Kuchenhof Gardens, Hortus Botanicus Leiden, and the Flora Holland Flower Auction. The tour dates are from April 16th through April 25th, 2024. Full details and registration are available on our website at discoverourtours.com. 
Remember, space is limited, so if you don't want to miss out, I would highly recommend signing up today. We look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands and sharing this unforgettable journey together. Get low maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of the perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is the last word on my fairy garden by Christy Page at Green Prince. I have always been fascinated by fairy gardens. As a child, I completely believed in fairies. I was convinced that they lived in nooks and crannies. They used buttercups to bathe in and spent afternoons napping under mushrooms. If there was a sparkle in a sunbeam, it was a fairy flitting by. And if there was a light tinkling sound, it was their laughter. I believed in a world of magic. As I grew up, I did not want to let go of that magic. I shared stories with my daughters of little woodland creatures. Fairy tales were a part of our nighttime rituals. As my daughters grew older, they may not have believed in magic and fairies, but they at least humored me. I visited several small fairy and gnome gardens and paths. They intrigued me. The time and dedication it took to plan out a fairy village or a gnome path was inspiring. There's even one a couple towns over from me where they welcome people to walk down the path and admire the decorations. This made me think that it might be time to start my own fairy garden. I mentioned it to my family, and although they may not have thought I was a little crazy, they were all on board. That Christmas, I received fairy and gnome items from pretty much every family member. I could not wait for spring. Once the snow had melted and spring was well upon us, I started planning out my fairy garden. I had houses, a little pond, benches, bridges, and even a little Ferris wheel. I spent an entire afternoon one weekend setting things up. I had the ferries all on one side with a town center and a park. Over the bridge, which was guarded by a dragon, is the gnome village. They have a small pond with lily pads and houses that look like tree stumps. I just let my imagination run away from me as I created my own little world of magic. I asked my daughter what she thought once it was all set up, and being a teenager at this point, she didn't quite believe in the magic anymore. She said that it looked like a five-year-old had been playing outside and forgot to bring their toys in. I had to chuckle because that's kind of how I felt. The world I'd been creating in my head for years was finally in front of me. Each year, I add a new piece to my garden. 
Unfortunately, I usually have to remove a piece that was damaged by the elements as well. None of this deters me though. I feel like I have a magical little kingdom in my own yard. While this garden may not have many flowers, although there are a few mushrooms and succulents, the amount of joy it brings me is immeasurable. And after all, shouldn't a garden bring joy first and foremost? This was the last word on my fairy garden with Christy Page at greenprints.com. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.